Good evening CNBC and to all of our guests for joining us once again for another Wednesday night recharge. Uh, we're grateful to God to have this opportunity to come back before you. Uh, we thank God for the ability of technology that allows us to come before you, to continue to connect with one another, and that is truly a blessing. I thank God for my production team, Sister Renfro, uh, Rachel, Rebecca, Brother Daniel Nichols, who make sure that everything is put together, the scenery and the setting and all of that stuff so that we can have a wonderful time together in Bible study. Um, many of you have probably uh, thought about and asked, when are we going to come back together as a church family? Uh, we watched uh, Governor Abbott's announcements on this uh, week earlier this week in regards to opening up the state of Texas. And so in listening to him, and thinking about still our church family and the caution that we ought to take, I've decided that we're going to continue to uh, have our worship services brought to you through YouTube. Now we will begin to meet with our leadership team to try and determine how we can come back together. Uh, the governor is phasing in a return to uh, business and some businesses are available to come back and to operate at a 25% capacity. And so when I looked at uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick's um, recommendations for churches and how we could make that happen, we were looking at how the seating needs to be and, and to continue the social distancing. It just didn't make sense to just kind of jump back into it just yet. And so we got to give it some time. We're going to kind of watch and see how uh, the state does, how the city does. Uh, so that we can then come together and we can do that in a safe way. So we'll begin to meet with leadership, sort of determine a, a timeline and a date. And so hopefully within a couple of weeks, we'll have that nailed down and can give you some more information. But I want to, uh, again, uh, caution us to be smart and to be safe, especially us in the African-American community, and, and looking at how it has affected our community, COVID-19, has really affected our community in a disproportionate way compared to all who have been uh, affected and contracted the disease, both in getting the disease and both in the deaths. And so I don't want us to be a part of that number. So let's continue to pray. Let's continue to lift up one another and we'll uh, let God's guidance and his spirit uh, give us our, our go ahead on when we can come back together want to share with you that since we continue in this time of uh, social distancing and using technology uh, to bring to you our worship services, this coming Sunday, uh, we want to share with one another in communion. And so we're asking that if you haven't done so already, there's an announcement that went out last night in regards to our communion together on this coming Sunday. So if you will please, ma'am, please, sir, take a, a look at Constant contact, check your email. There's information there about how we're going to do communion. Uh, more specifically, we're providing communion cups uh, for our church family, our church members. So this coming Saturday, between 10 and 12 p.m., our deacons are normally there anyway, collecting uh, offering, tithes and offering, uh, but they will also be there to hand out communion cups. Our deaconess uh, under the leadership of Sister Karen Renfro, they have already provided uh, for our communion cups to be set up to where the deacons can come out and hand you a communion cup or cups uh, for your family. And you can take those so that on Sunday we can share in communion together. So just pull up in the church parking lot. You don't even need to get out. They'll have their masks on, their gloves on. They'll come out and, and hand you uh, as many as you need for you and your family. So that again, on Sunday, after we view the worship service, you'll also have a chance that we might together commune with one another. Now, if you already have juice and bread at your home, you don't have to come and get a communion cup. We're just making these available to you. So if you don't have one, uh, but you have bread and juice at home, then feel free to use that. Again, it's our way of coming together as often as you eat uh, the bread and you drink the cup. We want to show the Lord's death until he returns. So we invite you to do that. Please, ma'am, please, sir, this coming Saturday, uh, make uh, time to do that. Um, there's a survey 
that we have been given through our uh, Baptist uh, Union. And it is a survey coming from the uh, leadership of our community. And they're asking us uh, to share information with them in regards to how COVID-19 is impacted, impacted us as a community. So again, I invite you to check out Constant Contact in that email. You'll see those questions that they're asking of us. And so if you don't mind sharing that information, something you want to get to us, and we'll pass that on to them. So how is it affecting us? We want to be sure that they know about that uh, so that they can use that information to make adjustments into how our community is better served. Another way of doing that is through our federal census. This is the year we do census, and I'm asking each of us, please, ma'am, please, sir, to fill out your 2020 census. That's how the government knows how to provide services uh, to our communities based on numbers. And if we're not counted in that number, then we can't complain about not receiving services. So please, ma'am, please, sir, let's complete that census, 2020 uh, census. Also want to keep you uh, involved uh, and uh, informed. So our One Heart Women's Ministry continues to meet on Wednesdays at noon. And so if you want to know how to connect with them, again, check Constant Contact. And that information should be there in our email or on our church website. Uh, I'm also glad to know that our men's ministry are also going to come together. Uh, both of those are doing Zoom meetings. Our One Heart Ministry, uh, our women's ministry, they're getting together. And that's through a Zoom meeting. Zoom is an app that you can download to your phone or your computer. And that way you're able to connect together. The men are also going to start a Men's Monday zoom meeting starting on may 11th at 7 p.m uh, so men let's let's again get that app download it so that we can come together and just check in with one another and connect and then lastly before we start our time uh, bible study together uh, let's remember our sick and our shut in uh, let's remember the first responders those who are on the front lines of this pandemic uh, let's remember also the special way Minister Demetria Batts and her family, her uh, grandmother passed away, her maternal grandmother uh, passed away this week. So let's lift that family up in prayer as well as all of us who may be going through. Let's bow in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you and we honor you and we bless you, God, for just being who you are. You are God who love us. You are God who protects and provides for us. You are a God who helps us. You know us, Master. And so because you're our Father, we bless you and we bring to you all of our cares and all of our concerns. Because as a good Father, you know how to provide for us everything we need. Especially those, God, who are going through uh, during this time of viral pandemic. How it has affected us as a country as a community, as a church, as individuals, Father. You know all that we're dealing with. And so, Father God, we place it at your feet. And we're trusting you as your people, your children, to give us guidance and to be our help now in this time of need. Your word says that you are a very present help in the time of need. So we're counting on your help today, O oh Lord God. So bless us and continue to keep us. And we thank you, God, for what you're already doing right now and what you have done and what you will do. Now bless us now, Lord God, as we go into a time of looking at, studying, and receiving your word. It is through your word, Father God, that we gain life and we understand truth and we receive power. So let your word speak to us tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you would, ma'ams, and sirs, if you will grab your Bibles, turn with me to the gospel according to John. The gospel according to John, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, I want to lift up three verses. John chapter 10, starting at verse 27, uh, 27, 28, and 29. God's gospel, chapter 10, 27, 28, and 29. I'm reading from the New King James Version of this passage. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I want to uh, tag this Bible study tonight in his hands. In his hands. And if you are a member of Corinth uh, Missionary Baptist Church and you have our uh, email and we have your information, you should have received a copy of tonight's outline in his hands. A few weeks ago, uh, I received a Facebook post, a Facebook clip of Tyler Perry. Uh, Tyler Perry, famed actor, producer, uh, movie and entertainment mogul, he started this little uh, sing-along uh, where he began singing the song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. And in that clip, he started it off and then he invited others to join in, to tag on to that clip, to add their spin or, or that their part of, of that particular song. And so you find he and his friends and other singers and other celebrities adding on to that song, he's got the whole world in his hands. And so this was his creative way, I believe, of reminding all of us that in the midst of this viral pandemic, we are all still in God's hands. No matter how it's affecting you, whether it's economically, whether it's socially, whether it's physically, uh, uh, educationally, no matter how it's affecting us, we are still all in God's hands. And, and it was a way of saying to us and reminding us that we're going to make it through because we are in God's hands. And so as we, we look at that uh, tonight in this creative way he has used to remind us, even from when we were children and learned the song, who would have thought that today that song could be used as a way of calming and easing our anxiety to be reminded, wait a minute, yeah, God still has us in his, his hands. I was driving along this past Sunday and I was listening to Pastor Joel Osteen. And even he mentioned something similar, that, that we are all in God's hands, so we ought not be overshadowed by everything that we hear. The negative press, uh, the negative uh, information that's being shared. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not good, but still we can find a blessing in everything. But it was to help us understand and know that even on our worst day, even on our worst day, if I'm in God's hands, that's still a pretty good place to be. And so we, we don't have to get depressed. We don't have to become disheartened uh, because we are in God's hands. So tonight I want to consider what does it really mean to be in God's hands? Um, how does that impact how you go about your daily business, how you function and deal with being quarantined, how you function with your family, how you deal with it on the job, especially if you are still considered uh, one of the essential workers and you still have to go to work and so you're still out there in it. How do you do that uh, knowing that you are in God's hands? Well, that's what we're going to take a look at tonight. John chapter 10, Christ says, that God has given us to him. God has placed us in his hands and that no one can snatch us out of the Savior's hand. So let's, let's look at it. Let's look at it. And so we want to keep everything in, in context. And so I'm going to start with a $50 word that doesn't normally end up in my $5 conversations every day. And that $50 word is anthropomorphism. Come on, everybody say it with me. Anthropomorphism. And anthropomorphism, there you know, is nothing more than ascribing or assigning human attributes, human characteristics to uh, those things that are inanimate, which means they're not alive. Uh, they're not human. These are things that are uh, uh, could be objects. You have ascribed or assigned a human attribute to a particular object. So anthropomorphisms 
help us to relate to God. That is, um, God is a spirit, right? But we use anthropomorphisms to describe God in the scripture. Uh, we ascribe hands to God. We ascribe feet to God. We ascribe ears to God. In other words, we give him human attributes so that we can better understand him. Now, again, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. He is not human. He, he does not have human flesh. And, and, and Jesus confirms this in John 4, 24, in his, his discourse with the woman at the well. You remember when they have their interaction and their conversation going back and forth, and she begins to talk about worship, and, and Jesus says to her, well, God is spirit. And those of us who want to worship God, we need to worship him. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, it's also Paul who confirms, and he shares with the uh, Corinthian church, that God, now the Lord, is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, 2 Corinthians 2 and 17. So therefore, God is not material. Uh, God cannot be touched. He cannot be seen because he is, he is spirit, but we know that God exists. We know that God is, is real. I've never seen a headache. I've never seen a stomach ache. But I know a headache and a stomach ache is very real because I feel it. I know how it affects me physically. And so you and I, even though we have not seen God, we know how God affects us physically and emotionally and, and spiritually. And so God is spirit, but an anthropomorphism helps us to better understand him. James Walden Johnson, he knew that. Y'all remember uh, his, his uh, famous poem, The Creation, and how he uses anthropomorphisms to describe God in his poem? One of them, and as far as the eye of God could see, the eye of God, darkness covered everything. Another sentence in his poem, then God reached out and took the light in his hands, and God rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun. Talking about how God created and he's using anthropomorphisms to explain his creation activity. Then the last one, then God stepped down. God having feet, he stepped down. And the sun was on his right and the moon was on his left. The stars were clustered about his head and the earth was under his feet. And God walked. And wherever he trod, his footsteps hallowed the valleys and bulged up the mountains. Again, using anthropomorphisms, human attributes, human characteristics to describe God. And so now we have tonight this human characteristic of understanding that we are in God's hands. What does it mean to be in God's hands? A topical study of the hands of God uh, reveal that they are an expression of his judgments, an expression of chastening, an expression of security, miracles, might, his providence, his protection, his, his provision, his punishments, his pleading. All of these are ascribed to God's hand. Now, I got a, a Bible here. This is a Thompson chain uh, reference Bible, or a Thompson Chain study Bible. This is the first Bible that my pastor, when I started preaching back in 1988, said, you need to, Gary, you need to get you a Thompson Chain study Bible. I say that because whenever you want to do a topical study in the Bible, a, a Bible like this will help you because I turn to uh, where it talked about the hands of God. There's an index in the back of this Bible, and it talks about hands. And then there is a topic dealing with the hands of God. And so there are all these scriptures that help me to see the hand of God. So I can see where uh, his hand is ascribed to his judgment or his hand is ascribed to the miracles that he does. So when we look at this topical study of this particular text, there, there, there are four of these um, attributes that I wanted to lift up out of this text for us tonight. I think that would help us with regard to understanding where we are even in the midst of a pandemic 
that we rest in, in the comfortable and safe hands of God. And so out of all of these that we're talking about, there are four that we're going to look at tonight. The first one, uh, when you talk about the hands of God, is might. Might being ascribed to the hand of God. The might of God can be understood in the statement here in the text where he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And so again, the context of this whole chapter is talking about Jesus the good shepherd and how he is a shepherd to the sheep and, and the sheep are you and I. And so as a good shepherd, he understands that they hear his voice. They, they hear his voice and they follow him. Verse 28, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Listen to that statement. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. And then verse 29 says, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Might, strength, power. No one is big or bad enough to snatch us out of the hand of God. When you and I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our, of, of our lives, then, then we've been placed in his hands. And by his might and by his power, no one is able to snatch us. Now, I took a look, look at that word snatch in the text. The word snatch from its original meaning is to seize upon with force or to rob. In other words, it's the difference between being, being robbed at gunpoint and when somebody steals something from you, a theft, and they do it uh, secretly, cunningly, they steal from you. But what he's talking about here is nobody's big or bad enough or powerful enough or strong enough to come at you because to be robbed is to be in your face, right? Uh, and, and, and so he's saying the might of God being in the hand of God says nobody's bad enough, nobody's strong enough to come and step to God's face like that and take you or pluck you out of his hand. We cannot be snatched from his hand. So to be in the hand of God is to know that he's strong enough to keep us and to hold us so that nothing or no one can pry us out of his hand. Read Psalm 98 and 1, and it talks about his right hand, the right hand of God, which is a symbol of strength. It is God who upholds us and, and keeps us with his mighty right hand. So when I look at the text and what Christ is talking about here, saying nobody can pluck us or nobody can snatch us out of God's hand, that talks to me about the might. And as long as we're in hands like that, we shouldn't have any concern, we shouldn't have any worry, especially in the midst of this, because God's might, his mighty hand protects and he keeps us. All right? Here's another one that comes out of this text that I want to lift up, and that is provision, that, that in God's hands are all that we need, our provision. Now, where do you get this from, Pastor? Because, again, I tell you that this particular chapter, John 10, is talking about Jesus as the good shepherd. What's the responsibility of a shepherd? His responsibility is to lead and, and to feed. It's his responsibility is to provide for his sheep. So because the Lord is our shepherd, we have everything that we need. So as shepherd, he provides for his sheep. When you look at Psalm 145, it says, uh, verse 15, it says, he opens his hands and satisfies the desire of every living thing. When God opens his hands, from his hands flow everything that we need, every desire. There's a chorus of the song, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It says, all I have needed, thy hands have provided. All that we need, God's hand will provide. So again, even if I'm running short, David says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never seen his seed begging for bread. So even when it looks like I'm running short, I can trust in the hand of God to be my provider. So don't count on that government stimulus check 
to be your provider. Thank God that, that that is a way he provides, but we cannot depend and rest on and look at our federal government as though it is God. No, it's not. Because even with all of that stimulus, somebody didn't get something. And even with all of that, the nation can run broke because it doesn't have enough to provide for everybody. But our God, our God, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, our God, who says the world is mine and everything there is in it, our God is able to provide from his hand. Everything flows out of the hand of God. Read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. That's because we have a shepherd who provides. And so again, his hand being a hand of provision, God is able to, God will provide. All right, let's look at another one. Number four, protection. Protection. Because the Lord is our shepherd, then he is our defender. We are defended because, again, looking at the entire context, if he's our shepherd, then he's also our defender. What did David say to Saul when, when, when he was trying to convince Saul that he was able to go up against Goliath? David says, I've got some history with defending what's mine. He said, when the bear came after my daddy's sheep, when the lion came after my daddy's sheep, he said, I defended them. I took them out. And so he says to Saul, I'm willing to go up before this giant because I've, had, I've got history with my God. My God is a protector. I serve the living God. And so when you look at the hands of God and, as, as a protection, you ought to know that as shepherd, uh, he will Protect. The staff of the shepherd not only guides, but it also guards. And with his hand, he protects us from all danger. Psalm 138 says, uh, verse 7 says, If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. You will extend your hand. Your right hand will save me. That's coming out of the uh, Holman Christian Study Bible. So it says to me that God is our refuge, that God is our safe place. So to be in his hands is to know that every danger or threatening situation has to first get by God in order to get to me. Has to first get by God in order to get to you. And even when it does get to us, it still has limitations. When I look at Job uh, chapter 1 verse 12, and Satan is saying to God, well, God, if you touch him, if, if you touch the stuff that you provided for him, if you take that away from him, God will curse you. And God says, no, no, I'm not going to touch him. I won't touch him with my hand. He says, I'll, I'll put him over into your hand. And God says, everything he has is, is, is yours for you to touch, but don't lay your hand on him, himself. In other words, God has given Satan some limitations because God is saying, I've got him in my hand. I'm protecting and keeping him. And so my trust, my hope, my faith is that I am held and I'm also hidden in God's, in God's hand. Which leads me now to the last one, which is security. Security. Look at the text. And when Christ is saying to them, I, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Christ saves us and we're saved. And he said they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Once we're saved, no one can snatch us out of his hand. No one can take our salvation away from us, not even us. Because he says they are safe and secure in my hand. Hand. He says, I'll preserve them. If I were preaching this, I'd be talking about the provision of God, the protection of God, and the preservation of God being in his hands. Nobody shall snatch him out of my hand. And so what he's describing here is the preserving power and strength and, and might and ability of, 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 of God and the power he has. And then he says, and it's backed by my father because my father has given them to me. And he's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of 
my father's hand. So Christ is saying, not only are they in my hand, but in turn, because I am the father on one, it also means that they're in the father's hand. And so nobody's greater than my father. Nobody's bigger and better than my daddy. Come on, you knew what that was like growing up as children. Uh, debating with your friends, about to get in a fight with your, with your buddy down the street talking about whose daddy was the biggest and whose daddy was the best. Here he says, nobody is greater than our God. And since there's nobody bigger, nobody greater, then, then who can snatch us out of his hands? What better place of security and safety than to be in God's hand? There's no force or being sufficient to sever the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, nor take us away from our Father. That's what it means to me to be in his hands. So when I hear that song now, he's got the whole world in his hands, that's saying to me, his might flows from his hand. Provision flows from his hand. Protection come from his hand. Safety and security, preservation, are all in his hand. So no matter how bad it looks and how tough our situation is, I'd rather be in the hand of God, in the midst of it, than to not be. Because when we're in the hands of God, my, we're in an awesome and wonderful and beautiful place, resting in, trusting in, the hands of our God. I trust and pray that you have been blessed and that you have been helped this evening by this Bible study. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, again, we say thank you for your word. God, your word is life. Your word is truth. Your word is power. And I pray, Master, uh, that your word has helped tonight, that it's been a blessing tonight. And I'm believing it is because your word says so. It does not return to you, Lord. But that, Father God, your people know that to be in your hand and to know that you have the whole world, the whole world in your hand, that we can trust that all is well and everything is going to be all right. So we bless you and we thank you now. In the precious name of your son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.